I want to see the results and I want to see things change. And the only way you're going to have change is to have enforcement of the laws. When I drafted the House bill, I included independent living and most severe persons with disabilities. At that time, we looked at it as the civil rights bill because it's all we had. But because it was limited to only entities that were funded with federal money, it wasn't really our Civil Rights Act, but it was a big step. At that time, in the early 70s, we had learned from what was going on in the women's movement, in the civil rights movement, in the anti-war movement, in the aging movement. We had to band together as a community to articulate a vision. And so we looked for lots of different opportunities where we could do things to get our message in the public eyes. One of the problems which we face is that everybody does want to treat us separately and differently now. And as far as we're concerned, that's the essence of discrimination. Title V of the Rehabilitation Act had five provisions, one of which is Section 504. And 504 says any entity receiving money from the federal government may not discriminate against one based on disability. So it was a very expansive provision. It covers primary, secondary, higher education. It covers universities. It covers healthcare institutions. It covers any, any entity getting money from the federal government. We will no longer allow the government to up, oppress disabled individuals. We want the law in force. We want no more segregation. We will accept no more discussion of segregation. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. Most people, a little latecomers, think Justin was the granddaddy of the movement. He actually came in a little later, and he immersed himself and then became a prominent player through his involvement in Republican politics. So you have this guy, Justin Dart, who could speak to many of the Republican leaders. Justin, he didn't really experienced the same types of discrimination that many of us experienced. But he learned about it. And as he learned about it, he could articulate it. He could speak powerfully about it. So he had that ability to really gain support from a very broad set of constituencies. Justin Dart was a guiding spirit. He understood the concept of process. He understood that we needed to take steps in educating the public, and the first step was educating the public of people with disabilities. So Justin himself went to all the 50 states, not once, not twice, but three or four times, meeting with groups of people with disabilities. And because of that, we were able to do the necessary research to present to the council what people with disabilities in America were saying about their lives and what was missing. It soon became clear that the principal need of people with disabilities in the United States in 1985 was for non-discrimination. And we had to make the recommendation that there be a law protecting the rights of people with disabilities. Each human being has an inalienable right and an inalienable responsibility to govern their own life, to participate in government of their society, and to be maximally productive in terms of quality of life for themselves and for all of their fellow humans. 
in the philosophy of community integration, we didn't want separate paratransit. We wanted, you know, for people to be able to go to the bus stop like everybody else and get on a bus. Who could argue with the notion that public transportation should be for the public and people with disabilities should have access to whatever the public has access to? So just think about it. It wasn't paratransit. It wasn't aircraft. It wasn't steamboats, trains. It was access to mainline buses. Now, that's very narrow, but we stayed focused on that. I don't know where they got room. What that evolved to was access as a civil right, which then permeated the work and the advocacy for the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We wanted to make sure that the board understood and heard us. But, well, they thought it would be better for us. They thought that their judgment was superior to ours. You know, we're doing this for you because we know better, um, because you're disabled and, and you're deaf. It was a very paternalistic attitude. And we said, no, that's not what we want. We can do a good job. We can do it very well, thank you. And that's when they made that decision, and they essentially ignored us. We must have a superior uh, president who will be able to inspire and motivate and lead a superior faculty, and that is why we voted that way. The woman who had been named president, when she saw what was going on, and when she correctly recognized it, a civil rights issue and not just a protest, she stepped down. I am thrilled to accept the invitation of the Board of Trustees to become the president of Gallaudet University. We had a vision. We expected to change the world. We had a compelling need and we had a compelling story. You know, if you have a good story, it's not hard to get people to watch it or listen to it. That's what we had. We had, the, we, had, we had 52 million people with disabilities who were disenfranchised in America, the country that prides itself on equality. And we had an answer to that problem. Disabled Americans must become full partners in America's Opportunity Society. The act has the potential to become one of the great civil rights laws of our generation. Disabled citizens deserve the opportunity to work for a living, ride a bus, have access to public and commercial buildings, and to do all the other things that the rest of us take for granted. So they were laying the groundwork for the ADA, basically, when they recognized that there was that piece of 1973 legislation that had a, a civil rights provision. And we're still not there. I would, I, it's funny, I was three years old and I have gray hair now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a long time. But um, Justin Jart, I think, was an interesting person because he understood his privilege. And at the time, his family had the Rexall drugstores, which is now Walgreens. So you can imagine the kind of wealth he was born into. And he wound up rejecting his privilege. He went and lived in a uh, rural community in Japan without his wheelchair for a time because he wanted to make sure he understood what other people were experiencing. And that was a pretty remarkable thing to do, especially that was long before that was in the 60s so it was before people were talking about privilege the way we do now about it now huh so what do we do about it now well it's interesting seeing those 
this footage is from before when the ADA was passed and you see the buses passing by people. And those are the stories that that's stories I've experienced, you've experienced and others. So I guess what I'm asking is we as a community, are we doing enough to get something to change? Well, this is a piece of it is making sure people understand this history and how long it is and what they went through, how hard they fought to get this done and how long it has been, which is um, nearly 50 years now that we've been trying to get this regular access to just the most ordinary things in life. And it's a lot of, uh, it's a long time. Phil just wants to do his job and that's, uh, and he has trouble getting um, uh, paratransit to be as helpful as they should be by, um, Phil, do you want to talk about? Should, should, we, should we switch to the panel? discussion yeah. now yes okay. please okay my name is martha brownlee duffick and renee asked me to facilitate this so uh, before we begin the panel discussion um i just want to thank renee not only for her lifetime service to disability justice but for setting up this specific event so that we can get the history of what a struggle it was to have disability civil uh, civil rights and now that brings us to current day and Tammy this was this is why you're that's this is why you're here today so um, as my, as I understand it the only real ground rules for this uh, discussion is um, to remind folks uh, not to use the names of specific transit workers and other than that I'm going to um, uh, go to each each uh, of the three participants in turn to t tell their story of their experience in Colombia. So, um, Tammy, why don't we go ahead and start with you? What kinds of experiences are you having with the transit system in Colombia today? Two major things. I think the worst time I was involved with paratransit, I was on a bus and there were two people with their attendants and they were in manual wheelchairs. And I know one of them was a vet and one of them was without a limb. So he was not able to do anything but sit in that chair. And the bus driver told them that they only had room for two chairs and they didn't have room for them. And he just said, we don't have room for you. He didn't say anything about two chairs, but he said, we don't have room for you. Me, I, I would have taken that completely a different context than there's only one wheelchair spot available. So when he said that, I was close enough to my destination that I said, well, let me get off the bus and then both of them can get on because they had their attendance, they had their groceries from the market. And, and I didn't, I mean, how else would they get home? Who knows? But to tell somebody, we don't have room for you in that context and that's all that was said in that, in, at that point in time, I think that was completely wrong. The buses are so narrow, sometimes the chairs don't fit in. And sometimes I get told your chair is not gonna fit in this slot. So that kind of goes along with what I just said prior. Yeah. So I hear um, not enough room for uh, wheelchairs, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, mo um, electric wheelchairs, and then the how 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 long would somebody have to wait for another bus if there's only two slots for a wheelchair? How long would somebody have to wait? I have personally minutes. Waited, I have personally waited more than three rounds, and each round is thirty minutes, except on the weekends. Then it's Four, it, 40. 40. 40. Okay, so a very long time. Okay, absolutely. Okay. Um, anything else that you that you want to say um, at this time? There'll be questions and answers after. Please put your uh, questions uh, in the 
in the, it's not in the chat, it's actually the Q and A box. And then we can bring them up with the pa panelists after this. But is there anything further, uh, Tammy, that you wanted to say at this time? Not pertaining to the reps themselves. Okay. Not pertaining to red uh, fixed routes. Because what we're, we're talking about, two different okay, systems, well, the, basically, that we rely well, on, which are the paratransit and the fixed routes. Okay, the paratransit, the fixed routes, I live at Freedom House, and they're all wheelchair, mostly wheelchair accessibility. And mm -hmm. we don't even have access to a bus anymore. We were taken off of all those routes. Right. Yeah, you have a long way to go to catch the bus because you yeah. have to go over to Boone Hospital. Right. And a lot of people here can't take a man man manual chair all the way up that hill. Mm -hmm. Right. Massive hill. And we never have understood why we were completely eliminated. And then, so the bus routing and fitting situation is one. As far as paratransit goes, it has taken me more than two years and several applications to even get an interview with paratransit. And it's just ridiculous how long it takes. My physician has already done like four or five of those doctor sign-in sheets, and we still haven't gotten an a interview or anything to be able to do that paratransit. I've never been able to do it. Okay. So yeah. I'm hearing, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm hearing three, three things. One, being taken off the, the bus route, which is different from, but uh, <laughs> relates to access all the same. The other is literally physical access to the buses themselves, not having enough space for wheelchairs, uh, the time between routes and the difficulty in accessing paratransit. So that, that's, a, that's a lot. <laughs> right, but if time between routes, you didn't have to wait. Like if mm -hmm. one route, if you're waiting for one, if you know ahead of time, it's 40 minutes. That wasn't my, what I was saying. What I was saying is if there's some, if there's not room for a wheelchair and there's already wheelchairs on there, you have to wait for the next route and the next route and the next route. I've had to wait for as many as three routes to go through. Wow. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I, I hear you. Very good. Thank you for clarifying. When I was talking about people being rude. I was talking about me getting off the bus so these other two people could get on in their chairs instead of just saying to them, we don't have room for you. Yes. Right. Okay. And then the paratransit is the paperwork. Okay. Thank you so much, Tammy. And we'll be coming back probably with questions. Um, uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to move on to Phil. Hey, hi. hi. How are you doing today, Martha? Martha? I'm fine, Phil. How are you? Can you tell us uh, about your experience with uh, with the transit system in Columbia? Yes, I've been told by a driver uh, they're not a taxi service. Uh, they'll get you there when they get you there. Uh, and by the same driver, he questions me why I had to be at work so early and all that. If he had his way, I wouldn't be getting to work until he got me there. I called paratransit several times about it because this, this this has been when I start my new job. I had told them I had to be at work. Start I had to be at work at 10 o'clock because I start work at 11. They mm -hmm. were scheduled me at 1045 and not guarantee I would be there until possibly after 12. Oh my goodness. Okay. And the back to the same driver, trying to put, I had this all in my mind. I did my work like Renee said, <laughs> but I didn't type out, but I did do my work. Uh, other situations, the driver picked up this guy who has bad feet and he doesn't, I don't think he knows how to take care of himself. His shirt was all the way up to Top of his chest, his stomach was all blowing and hanging out. The driver told him, said, if you keep doing this, I can't allow you to ride because of your bad hygiene and all that and bad feet and your shirt sticking. 
up to your chest. And the guy, I know he has a disability. And he has some pr problems. Uh, it takes a while to get off the bus because he's worried about leaving stuff. He keeps getting back on, checking to see if he has everything. Dragger physically told him, look, you got to go or I'm not going to pick you up anymore. You got to take care of your hygiene too. Mm -hmm. And this thing, that is wrong to say for that person. The same driver stops right middle of the route after picking up somebody. He stops to go in to talk to somebody somewhere, leaves everybody on the bus, comes back, and has a cigarette break. And I smell, I don't believe this is from other passengers, but I have smelled pot on his clo driver's clothing when he's putting somebody, snapping somebody in the wheelchair and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I call to make a schedule, they do not call you back. And they, you call them in the morning and they'll say they call. And that's what they have written down. But I have um, I have a car ID. There was a day my friend was here visiting me. And they say on Sundays they will call back to confirm your ride at 3.30. There's been on Sundays I stayed home and waited, waited, waited until 8 o'clock at night time. No phone call. Call in the morning. They said they called. There's something wrong with my phone. The phone never rang. So it sounds like a lack of um, respect for the time you need to be at work yeah. and, uh, and for other passengers. And then this just difficulty with access again, that, that you're not getting called back. It's not a, a one, one time thing that, but that it happens repeatedly that you don't get called back by paratransit. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, you got that right, Margaret. Then uh, there's been times, I'm trying to throw everything at once. Forgive me if you get confused. Please ask me if that's correct. If you want to, that's fine. Um, a couple of days ago, I was supposed to be, I requested a ride to the library after I got work. They came and got me. The driver said, uh, you ready to go home, Mr. Dill? I said, no, I'm supposed to be going to the library. They had screwed up saying I was going home, didn't get picked back up for the library. That didn't come out of my mouth. And the driver on the other end who was supposed to pick me up at the library uh, had on his schedule, I was supposed to be picked up at the library at 5 o'clock. And I did get home. Second time, a request for a library ride. They picked me up, dropped me off on my answer machine and said they'll be there at 5.15. They showed up at 5.06 and left. Um, Shemin asked or raised her hand. I'm, I'm really bad at uh, I'm really bad at this. I don't see a hand raised or know where to press. Uh, I just saw that she had raised her hand. I see, and screen. I see it in my screen. Two people now. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I don't see hand raising. Let me, let's do this. Can we, I, I see in the Q and a box, it has three, um, Three questions. Can we, um, let's see. I'll, I'll, let me try this and see if we can get Shamin uh, for the, okay. Uh, I'm, I apologize for my uh, not being able to do technology well, but um, please post, post questions in the Q and A box and then we can have um, the participants answer those questions after the, um, after the presentations are, are finished, if that would be okay. Uh, I want to say real quick, 
How are they getting away with this? Is a question from my mom. How are they getting away? Paratrans getting away with the you're supposed to be ready in 10 minutes and they show up half an hour later. If you're not out there in 10 minutes, the time you're requesting that's considered no show. How are they getting away with that and getting in the way with, like, say, I get out work at three o'clock? Uh, they don't pick me. I make this quick. Sorry, Martha. They don't pick me up till say four thirty. How are they getting away with it? Their excuse is saying they don't have a, dr- a van on that side of town, but they do. Do they know anxiety? With people have disabilities, some have anxiety. I had diabetes and anxiety that will raise my blood sugar high. By the time I get home from way until four thirty. That raises up my blood. Two, do they understand some management of places where people who have disabilities work? Do they understand some of the employees don't want the person sitting there the whole time? You know, I think those are really good questions, Phil. And they raise the they they raise the issue of. Um, one of the reasons why it's so hard for people with disabilities to be able to maintain employment because of the the problems with accessing timely getting to work and getting home from work. Um, and so I, I don't have an answer to your question, but these are the kinds of things that we, we certainly want to bring out um, so that, that that I think those are internal questions that transit would have to address directly. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Renee. But but, th- but thank you for bringing them up because they are they are really important, um, and they and they raise these important issues about access. Um, Okay, uh, Phil. If uh, with your permission, I'm. Go- I was going to go on to Bev. Is there anything? Yeah, else? that's fine. No, there's not. That's it. Okay, um, Bev. Uh, would you be able to uh, share with us your your experiences with uh, transit in Colombia? I'm I'm like a lot of the other uh, riders also because the things as far as my thing is. And not, a, not enough, not enough rides on the vans and the pair be at the paratransit as well as the city bus. And then I think the same thing that what Phil was saying, the way that they treat you and talk to you, I can have experienced that also. And my thing is, if they can turn around and, and uh, I just think my problem is that the transit system, I feel like I'm an older woman and I feel like my life, I, I, I myself, as a 67 year old woman and i feel like the people that run the system down there tell us what to do what we can and can't do and they monitor like to the buses and they can come and get you and not come and get you and and the time and that's my problem i don't really have a uh, since i don't drive anymore and the things that i see and i just feel like i'm i feel like i'm being not so much as and when the 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 little May, uh, sorry about that, gang, but the little video that we were saying about discrimination and, and uh, that, I feel like that too. And I feel like that as a, a Black person, as far as it's being dis, uh, dis, uh, discriminated against, as well as being discriminated against as being disabled also, I see that as one and the same. And, and I, um, my problem is uh, with uh, what the other people, Tammy and Phil are saying, I feel the same way also, as far as treatment and stuff like that. And I feel like I'm a little older than them. And as far as getting around and they treat you the way that they want to treat you, like we're like we're like we need them. And we do need them in a, in a sense. But at the same time, we are somebody. Mm-hmm. We are all somebody. And that's what bugs me the most. The transit system. Yeah. With that. Yeah, absolutely. And and so, um, yeah, that. <laughs> Yes, you, you are somebody. You are are people, and you f- and you feel like you're being uh, not only uh, marginalized as a black uh, woman, but uh, as a person with a disability. So it's kind of a, a double whammy. Yeah, yeah, and like the people on the paratrain. But like Phil was saying, that one of the drivers I've been down like that. You have to go to the doctor, but they'll get off and go talk to people and and. Uh, do what they want to do and stop and go here and there and leave you sitting on the van and just the things. But so I don't complain a lot 
Mm-hmm. Nobody complains. I've seen things, but if it doesn't try to concern me, I try not to say too much because I'm I worry about being put off the van or yeah. you know because I remember one time I was the very first time I was able to ride the paratransit when I became disabled. But when it came to me again to ride it a second time mm-hmm. for a time to be renewed or whatever. OK, they told me I couldn't ride it because now they had the kneeling buses and all that stuff, you know, but I was approved the first time to ride it. Mm-hmm. And the second time, years back, I couldn't ride it anymore because they, the guy down there told me when I had to go into the meeting and meet with them, he told me, well, now we got the kneeling buses, the buses yeah. on, are on your, you know, in your neighborhood and all that stuff. So I couldn't, they told me I couldn't ride it anymore. Well, then one of my other friends who also is disabled and she had talked to some of the people downtown and she came back to me and told me to call and write a letter to call the guy that was over the thing down there. So he, I, he I called him, he told me to write him a letter and ask why, and tell me the reason why I need to ride the paratransit and this net and the, you know, so, and like I said, plus I just see the, the streets and the curves. And so anyway, that's my problem. Just riding. I just want everybody to be able to ride the bus in more than one spot. And I've been out there before when it was cold and waiting on the corner, waiting for the bus to come through and the bus didn't come through. Then when I called, they told me they had changed it to the snow route. I had to keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And they didn't send anybody paratransit to come and get me, but I had to wait all that time. And then it got to be dark and cold. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, when they finally showed up again, Sometime hours later, people stop by and saying, are you, are you okay? Are you going to be all right? So on, so on, so on, so, you know, which is embarrassing to me. It was to me though, but at the same time, I'm out there freezing and shivering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at the same time cold. And then, then when the bus came and we got, it got to be dark, we'd go along the way, going back down to the station, there was a little kid, a little boy that was out there waiting. He had to ride the bus to go. And he was probably where his parents were probably where it's sick where he was to come home from school to get, but he was on that same route and see, that's what I'm saying. But they just need to, they need to, and like Phil said, they need to talk to the people down there and, and the time and fill the waiting time. Yes. Yeah, right. The pickup time, but then they only wait, they can be late. That's my thing. They'll be late and mm-hmm. they, that's all right. But at the same time, they only give you three minutes to go out there. It's not like, you know, so they'll show it, have you as a no show. Now that's wrong right there. Yeah. Mm-mm. So and that's all I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, because I just, as far as that, because I, everybody is somebody, no matter their, if they're okay or disabled or whatever. And so, and, and everybody, everybody matters in my eye. It, well, a- absolutely. And that's well said. And thank you for, for sharing your experience and your voice. And um, I, I was getting cold just listening to your story about having to wait all that, all that time. Yeah, I'll never forget that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and the basic unfairness of, you know, people can, you know, take a phone break or a smoke break while everybody is loaded up on the bus. Yes. But if you're less, if you're not right there when they happen to come, then you're a no show. So I think those are all important points. Um, I'm going to go to the, the Q and a box now. And, um, I'm going to read read the questions that the audience has uh, submitted, and then have have uh, have you folks, um, Tammy and Phil and Bev, uh, respond to what the audience is asking. So I I can only do one thing at a time here. So I'm going to get the Q and A box. Uh, okay. Um, so are you consulted when the city bus order? When the city orders buses and trains the drivers, have have you all, uh, as riders, been consulted about any of that? Never. Never. Okay. Bev? No. Okay. No. So it sounds like um, people who ride the bus are not the people who are involved in um, ordering buses and the kind of training. Um, no, but Martha, can I say they, but Martha, they say, I've had drivers say, well, come to the meetings, but you know, but the meetings, but see, they don't tell you a lot of times. I don't think they tell you us, the clients, they don't tell us about the meetings because they don't want to many people to be down there complaining or saying, you know, I, I think that though, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think so. And you had, uh, you had kind of uh, raised the question that, um, that you don't, you're afraid to say too much because you don't want to get, to have it be 
retaliation. They have to be retaliated against and have things be made worse. Is yeah, my I don't want, yeah, I don't want that, you know. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so then there's another question. Um, uh, the film said demand access to the regular buses, um, but in this situation, would paratransit be better? Um, so, um, Tammy, so in terms of you had said that you aren't able to access paratransit. Is that correct? Right. It's taken. I mean, I've tried been trying to get on paratransit for years with no avail. But why should I go with straight paratransit when I'm trying to be like a normal human being in every other society? I should I should be able to do the uh, regular bus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but absolutely. Well, there's there's that, and paratransit requires advanced scheduling, yeah. and then you have to have them call you back, and then if something goes mm -hmm. wrong and you have to change it, you can get penalized, and so you lose spontaneity that uh, is kind of necessary for everyday life. Yeah, and that other and that that non-disabled people who are riding the bus have Take, they, they can decide granted. at a moment's notice that they're going to leave and then go, and that's not true yeah. with paratransit. Having a traumatic brain injury because I have MS and I have seizures, so um, having a TBI, you don't always remember to call ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Those are all all good. Good points. Um, let's see, we have another uh, question. Um, John Bowders says, thank you, Bev, Phil, Tammy, and Renee for all of your insights to what is unacceptable treatments toward anyone. And then he asks, who is in charge of the transit system, including paratransit? Renee, do you wanna? Um, Mike. Sokoff is the transit manager, is the current transit manager. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, another question. Um, okay. <laughs> Susan Carter is saying, so people are left alone on the paratransit buses when the driver goes on a break. Is that yes. what I heard? So she's yes. like not, not believing that she just heard that. And I'm seeing yeah. every, everybody mm -hmm. is nodding their head and saying yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, then uh, can we write, can we compile a written list of these experiences and where possible suggest solutions and present the list to city council? Um, that sounds, what sounds doable? What, what are other people thinking? Should that go through the disability commission first, Renee? Um, I think we should have, uh, I, I think it would be good to have uh, a citizen organized group okay. possibly propose some things to both the Disabilities Commission and the Public Transit Advisory Commission. I was just curious because yeah. they have the attorney no, that could look over everything to make sure we were not doing anything wrong. Right. It, absolutely. That that's that's why I think maybe a citizens group okay. organized with um, some ideas and um, then um, either way I'm in. Them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's okay, okay? We've got solidarity. Yeah, <laughs> she's in. Um, um, okay, and then. Um, the, uh, Peggy Placer says, great responses. We need to demand access. And Gretchen Mani says, really appreciate you all sharing your experiences. If there was any one thing you could change to improve Columbia's transit system for you and others with disabilities, what would that be? Treat us equal. <laughs> I would start with uh, having... Um, um, more than one bus on each line so that they go faster. Yeah. And I think that would be, uh, have a, a solidarity benefit like Heather McGee has talked about in um, the Some of Us where 
that would benefit non-disabled riders too, because yeah. then it would make the bus more practical to use if there was less of a wait time. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so uh, d double up so that there's less of less waiting time. Um, yes. And, and that's, that's, that's a, a very excellent suggestion. That's how buses get used more. It's one of these downward spirals where uh, the less frequent the bus is, the, you know, the less frequent wider ridership is, except as one woman who was standing in line at a city council meeting told me the only people that ride the buses are people who have no other choice. That's and captive riders is how that is what they are called <laughs> or we are called actually because I'm one yeah because I yep. uh, it's illegal for me to drive yeah um so, so so that would be your your one that would be your one thing is increase the frequency um, yes because that would um benefit captive riders as well as people who choose to ride the bus absolutely okay good uh, Tammy, any any one thing? Um... Make make a bus that has more wheelchair accessibility. A lot of times, two wheelchairs is not enough, and they're not wide enough. The buses need to be configured just a little bit differently, if possible. Okay. The older buses were actually more suited than the newer buses as far as width and wheelchair accessibility. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. It's the electric buses that are too small to fit more than one wheelchair. Okay. Okay. That's, and that's really important. That, that's really important. But yeah, the number of wheelchairs that will fit the access, the physical access space. Yes. Um, <laughs> Renee's talking well, about time you, and space. You go, when you go in to get in a wheelchair spot, you have to drive forward into the bus. Then you have to turn your wheelchair completely around so you can pull into that spot facing the window. There's not room to sometimes to pull that, turn that wheelchair all the way around and then get in that slot. There's not, there's not enough room in the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, and then you have to be, you have to be positioned in a certain way so you can be locked down. Your wheelchair can be locked down. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, good. So the size, the frequency, the size, um, and and then, uh, Phil, if there was, if there's one thing that you could change about the transit system to make it better, what what would be at the top of your list? I'm gonna put everything in one. If that's okay. One, I think when they pick you, when you tell them to pick you up at a certain place, mm -hmm. where my apartment is, I live at Broadway Apartments behind Petco mm -hmm. Stadium, Broadway. Uh, I always request when I call to make my ride, could you please pick me up on the 100 building side facing the bus stop so I know you guys are out there and all that. Instead of parking all the way down by the office and all that because they're so concerned about hitting somebody. I think if they listen to people's requests and pay attention on how they're scheduling. Mm hmm uh, they could that could change some things, make things start getting better. Okay. Because I seen other drive. I make this quick, Marfa. Sorry, I, I'm so sorry. No, you're fine. I make I seen other drivers drop me off at that area. Mm -hmm. They don't have issue backing out coming in. Okay. Uh, I've, it's just easier for everybody just to if they would pay attention to requests and all that and how they're word it and okay. I think it'll make things change. I do agree with the other people about the wheelchair things. I mean, there are some times I got on the bus, paratransit bus, they had so many wheelchairs on there. It was hard to squeeze through that narrow okay. path. Okay. I think they should make figure out how to make a better bigger as Tammy was saying, more space to yeah. So have a place to sit down and all that. Yeah. So, so, um, so I, I guess I'm hearing two different things. One is when it comes to paratransit, which you have access to having them be more consistent in terms of 
following up, fo- following people's re- requests and yeah. then and, and requests for where to stop, requests for uh, when they're coming and, and those kinds of things uh, for to be more responsive on paratransit and then the same issues um, that Tammy was talking about in terms of physical space on the bu- on the electric buses. Sure. Okay. Um, and Bev, how about you in terms of what's the at the top of your list? If you could change one thing about the transit system, what would be would, if the buses would run longer? That's my thing. If they'd run longer, because I feel like once and uh, if they would run longer, and God knows if they stop on Saturdays, it's like oh Lord. <laughs> because I just feel like we would be basically <clears throat> up a creek without a paddle if you don't have a car and you don't drive and uh, the people and my thing you know everybody it's uh, it's not the people that uh, but it's I think a lot of time it's the drivers they make the and plus the people that are over the the people the dispatchers downtown from the drivers I've been on the bus before when the drivers will call in and say one thing that something's blocked up but then the person at the person that's issuing out the orders telling them what to do they'll tell them just to go on pass and if you're over there and somebody's waiting out there on the other side waiting for the bus to come and the and they're waiting 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 and the bus never shows up and like I said they could be late for work or whatever the issue but at the same time it comes from the person that's delivering the uh, telling them what to do downtown don't worry about it just go and don't try to go back around and make you know divert the route to go I just mm-hmm. think that's kind of messed up because I'm out there waiting 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 and they did that the other day I was on the paratransit I heard the radio somebody on the bus I guess call in and say that they had missed them missed around and the person said, just keep going. Don't worry. Try to back route and go back around and you start over again. You know, yeah. but I'm just saying you got people out there waiting and like, it was everybody. Yeah. You know, I just think a lot. I think the people, I think, I don't think a lot of time it is as a driver. It's a whole lot of time, but a lot of times I think it's the people down there in the office itself. They're giving out the orders. I think they need to be reminded so, or hands. Yeah. yeah. So those two points of interaction with transit that, that, you have to deal with with paratransit. Yeah. You have to deal with the scheduler, and and then you deal with the drivers. Well, not so much that it used to be the paratransit, not so much as sometimes it's the no. the city bus itself. But you, because you're being on the paratransit, you can still must go hear them coming over the radio too. What the people driving the city buses are saying also. So mm-hmm. that, and I just think, uh, and okay. I just think a lot of, and and my thing is too. Why are there so many buses out there on the campus, but then we don't have enough buses to. Uh, for the people, the townspeople, I don't think that's fair. Yeah, you know, that's you know, the tiger line, and I've had a, I've had <clears throat> problems with that myself because they're transporting people from their cars. I know, but still, that's kind of ugly. Listen to me, transporting people to their cars. Now, what kind of stuff is that when they can walk and yeah. they yeah. <laughs> to their cars when they can walk or whatever? But then we're out there, and but like we can't. We can't get to where we are because there's only limited buses for us. But you, like I said, you got a lot of buses out there lined up over by the union. Okay. With, yeah. With yeah. The, the students so, at the apartment complex, and that's ugly. Yeah. So for able bodied people, able bodied pe- students on campus, there are buses lined up and running yeah. regularly yeah. every 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how often that is, okay. but I just see all these buses out there. Yeah. And so for uh, people, so for disabled people living in town, the bus might just be told by somebody downtown, just go on pass because, you know, you're behind. And then the uh, person with a disability or just a person trying to ride the bus bus, is just left left standing there waiting. I was on the paratransit, but I heard the people driving the city bus. I heard what you called in and said that to the dispatcher downtown. And they, mm-hmm. and I thought they were going to say back up and go back around, but mm-hmm. they didn't. They just said go on, and then yeah, because that's why I just think that's ugly when you're out there waiting, waiting, waiting. You know. Yeah. So that's how people. That's how you end up waiting out there uh, in the cold, yeah. or or in the heat with your groceries melting. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, and that, yeah, yeah. And, I feel, and as a matter of fact, I saw, I was on the paratransit last week, and we picked up this guy. And he rides a paratransit and every day when I'm on the, I guess I know he works there at that one spot. But that day I was on the paratransit when they picked him up and he was saying the day before that he had been on there and then he went and said the paratransit people never showed up to pick him up. And it got to be dark and they asked him how he got home. 
He said he called his sister. He told me how many hours he, he told the driver how long he had to wait. And it got to be dark and he ended up calling his sister, but the pair of transit people never came or never called. And so that's why I said, so there's something's just got to be done. And yeah. Because they, they just get away with murder, sort of. <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, I mean, and I've heard a clear and consistent theme about and then when you call, yeah, Martha, when you call, it's like nobody knows who it was or what happened, you know, everybody dummies up and nobody knows what's what, you know what I mean? So I just think that's kind of something that just has to be. Mm hmm. Well, down there, no kick, I think I feel like I matter and everybody, everybody matters, but I feel like the people that have cars, like the people downtown, they have their own cars and their children have their own cars. They don't have to worry about it, but they don't think they're less fortunate, you know. And now, yeah. since I have to say, I haven't always been disabled. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I had mine, I hate to say, I always paid attention because I went out of school and I saw a lot of people with disabilities, so I never thought that, but I now what I see now, and I hate to say I didn't care not, you know what I mean, back then, but I did I always have, but stuff that I see now that I'm disabled, eyes, I guess, have been opened even wider. It, exactly. When it's not part of your lived experience, you don't understand it in the same way as you do when you are waiting for a long time in the freezing cold for a bus. That, yeah. that, that makes it very clear. Yeah. Uh, and that's why uh, I say, I don't want to say yeah. I'm ashamed to think that away, but I, you know, have to no. put that out there. Yeah. Don't don't be ashamed. That's how that's how that's how we all are. We we wake up to uh, we wake up to things over time. Um, hopefully, if we're lucky, we wake up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And then finally, uh, John ba Bowders has is saying, uh, how about requiring recurring training of transit workers, drivers, and professionals with disability knowledge and with the transit users participating in training as well. Is, yeah, that, something, is that something that you think would be helpful? I think that would be great because it's training from more than one perspective and it's mm -hmm. training people out throughout the community, not those of us with disabilities only, but with three at the community. And that way we could get more people on the bus so that we could keep the buses. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, Health and Human Resources could or, uh, uh, care about it. Utterback does a good job with educating people through. Um, uh, they don't always have to make that mandatory to, for them to show up because if they don't make it mandatory, because even now, you know, they yeah. they're supposed to go to meetings down there. A lot of them don't go to meetings down there, I've been told. Mm -hmm. So that would have something to be mandatory that they have to show up at, because a lot of people, well, I'm not going to go, I don't care, because you know, there's a whole lot of people that don't care, but just don't say it, but, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I understand your concern, Bev, is that, you know, people will either not show up or, you know, be uh, on their cell phones during the training if it's mandatory. <laughs> um, well, we have the uh, building inclusive communities mm -hmm. that um, have been really good. Mm -hmm. um, and they've had a lot of different workshops. Yeah. And I wonder if they could be helpful in well, Renee, what do you mean? Um, um, well, what I'm saying is that there's there's a, a a a template, basically a format and a workshop structure that exists yes. already. And I wonder if they would be helpful in expanding that for transit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so I that that sounds like that sounds like a good idea, um, and I uh, <laughs> I think I must be getting reactive to these stories because I'm thinking, oh yeah, right. let's put on let's put cameras on, <laughs> let's put cameras on the, on the buses. And <laughs> they do, Martha. Yeah. They have the cameras on the buses. I thought I thought they have cameras as well. I as think they are on there. Really? So is I, in I'm some not sure they're there. on there. I know they're on school buses. So maybe we need to use the school buses when they get to a certain point. We can pull the cameras out. No, I thought the they had cameras. Uh, they do have cameras on the buses and as well as the paratransit too. I know they do. I, well, yeah, I think they do. Are they active? 
I, see, that's what I'm saying. I don't know because sometimes maybe I don't know if the, maybe that's the, the cameras. You see, I don't know if the cameras are because you know you see things on the bus and and the drivers. So I don't know if the cameras are on the microphones only when they need to have them on. So yeah. I don't, Anyway, it was it, it was just a thought, you know. I, mm-hmm. I I grew up. I'm a psychologist. I grew up in sort of the 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 era of behaviorism, and I thought, you know, have it have it videoed. I mean, have it videoed, and then yeah. each each driver's performance is evaluated by you know rand you know by randomly an independent uh, body that randomly uh, looks mm-hmm. th- through the videos, and and well, so it's behavior. That counts. I wonder if something like a, you know how they do those secret shoppers in different oh. stores and markets? What about doing something like that on the bus? I, I, you know, I don't know about the secret shoppers, but you were talking they about sort of they, they observation. The yeah, they do their shopping and they do it just like they normally would. Uh-huh. And then they do a survey and a report on what the customer service was what the market was, what the prices were, were the price gouging? If you, if you had to ask for help, did you get the help that you needed? I mean, that kind of stuff. That And they use those surveys to improve the market. Yeah. Okay, we kind of like undercover boss. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if something like that would actually help transit all okay. the way up. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. Peggy Placer, who knows about secret shoppers says that's a great idea. Um, no. other... Sorry, sorry, Martha. Sorry about that. Go ahead, go ahead, Phil. Uh, how about I'm not sure if this work would be possible. How about putting one one of the supervisors on the bus, one supervisor, one day a week, have a supervisor on the bus watching the driver and with since they have so much problems with scheduling and all that have one of the schedulers ride with the driver Mm -hmm. and see what the driver goes through Mm -hmm. and i'm not making excuses for drivers some of the drivers are really uh responsible getting people on time there's been so one of the drivers i had Mm -hmm. yesterday right at 8 20 right on time it was eight 15 right on time culver's restaurant or work i can i don't feel comfortable using that yeah so dropped I've, off at 8 15 driver yeah. yesterday 3 16 uh i think if they had a couple of schedules on bus with the driver and a supervisor once a week they all could see what really is going on and forgive me for interrupting. I'm sorry. No, you're you're fine. I think um, having I think that having people like schedulers who are in an office downtown, having riding the bus be part of their training experience, um, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I think every I think that what we're seeing is that people who actually use the system are the people who have the <laughs> good ideas for what needs to go into training. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a comment, John Bowder says, Great, Plain, Great Plains ADA Center uh, might be, be uh, you know, a, a group that could run the training. And then uh, Susan Carter comments that Health and Human Services is underfunded. Uh, what would they need to be able to do training with staff about servicing people with disabilities? So, you know, Yes, they are underfund, uh, understaffed and underfunded, but maybe the Great Plains uh, folks could step in and, and, and do some of that. So, um, is, and what, is, yeah, what, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry but I just wanted to put this out there while we're talking about groups. Mm-hmm. One of the groups that I work with at Services for Independent is called People First, mm-hmm. and that's using the proper language so that we teach the proper language and and so that you know, maybe they're not being trained in that, so they don't know exactly how to say something a certain way or how to, I mean, I know if you're just rude, you're rude. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no way around that. But I mean, a lot of times we've gone into locations and worked with people on people first and the language and how to help people with certain things and, you know, people with disabilities. And it it teaches people a lot. 
about mm-hmm. how to live better with them in that particular community. Yeah, no, I think that I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, yeah, being respectful, being respectful to people first um, is is certainly true. Um, and anyway, you all have been wonderful. Let's see what. Let me look and see. Oh, so we're coming up on two o'clock. Um, <laughs> Renee, Renee, um, where is there? Uh, are there further? Well, I should ask the audience if there are further questions. Please post yeah. them in the Q and A. Um, and then, do you want to do kind of close out remarks at this point? Um, well, I didn't have any closing remarks. But I would say that uh, anybody who wants to take part in a citizen advocacy group, we could most likely do that through Race Matters Friends or with Race Matters Friends guidance. Um, As um, they have uh, a lot of experience and have been engaged with um, the city on multiple fronts. And I've done a very good job. Yes. All of this, I I saw a blip about this being available on the YouTube Race Matters Friends, something, but I didn't see it all. So maybe Renee, you could clarify that that, so that other people could see it again and listen to it again. Sure. Um, Yeah, I'll send it to you on... um, but that blip just went through. I just saw YouTube. So you might explain yeah. that. It wasn't just now. Race Matters it. Friends has a YouTube channel and it'll be available on there. Okay. Um, we, have, we have one more uh, question um, from S- S- Suzanne Carter about um, how, how people are able to get to city council meetings to advocate, and I think that's one of the one of the problems. Um, it, it that's understand. one thing the city does right. Oh, okay. <laughs> help me help me understand that. So th- th- there th- is an option for anybody to um, call. They have to make advance arrangements for <laughs> a ride two city council meetings, any after hours meetings. Okay, good. that's um, good to know. I didn't, re- I know the buses don't often uh, run. They don't they run do. past seven. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, for after hours meetings, mm-hmm. if you call ahead and, and that's available to anybody. Okay, okay, that's good to know. And that has to be known Renee, also to when those oh. meetings are happening. Yeah. Who, who do you call, Renee? Paratransit. Right, but a lot of people don't know that. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. what I was asking. So they would know, they would know who to call. Yeah, and the yeah. Times on, that they also. on the uh, website, um, gocomotransit.net. Um, if you look under services, it there's uh, under the services menu is where you'll find it after our transportation for city meetings. Okay, that, that's really good to know. I, I did not know that. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, any other uh, cl- closing, whoop, just a mm-hmm. sec. Closing, closing remarks or any last things that uh, you wanna add, Phil? Uh, no, I- Appreciate this meeting, and I do not understand why a paratransit a driver could tell a, a passenger <laughs> why he doesn't understand why they can't just walk or take the city bus. And that's just the thing that came on mind, and I do appreciate. Second, I do appreciate Renee. Forget you get in touch with me and what you're doing. You guys are doing a good job. I really hope this works. Yeah, me too. Well, it is very good to help. Yeah, and I think that's that's the point of having this kind of meeting is to 
um, sort of tell the untold stories of what it's like to experience uh, the bus and paratransit system um, so that people can, you know, you know, get together and organize and do advocacy like at city council and things like that. And I did see some city council members um, make comments about they couldn't believe what they were hearing and different things like that. So they were paying attention to this, Phil, just so you're aware. So it is going to make a difference. And I th myself, yeah, I think can... it's... I'm myself. sorry. I was going to go, Bev, I was going to, um, going to you to kind of for clo any closing comments you might have. Well, I would think if they would have more, I, myself, I believe, this is me speaking, I believe that they'd have more ridership on the, para, tra, the transit system period if they would treat people better and listen to what the folks have to say and give them more options to have because as far as cutting stuff down, they start stuff out and then they stop it. You mm -hmm. know, like at one point they had them running on Saturdays or I mean the buses and just the different time frames. If they would listen to what the people the people yeah. in the town would have to say and listen to their suggestions and comments and stuff like that and take that to heart. I think, I do believe the ridership would pick back up. Yeah, I, I th that sounds really important. Actually listening to the people who use the bus yes, in yeah. terms of uh, recommendation for routes rather than yeah. presuming they know the answers when they're not the people using the buses. Yeah, and then therefore in the things that they do and the steps that they make, and like I said, to me, like to having all those buses out on the campus and, and only a few here and within the city, and if they were listening to us, to us people, myself and everybody else, if they listen to what the people of the town have to say, I think ridership would, co ridership would come back up. Mm -hmm. And I well, think they'd be able to keep they run things a little better than what they was happening right now. And please don't stop the buses on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, but that's an equity issue. When you give people who have a lot of options more, yeah. in, while people who have fewer options are left with less. Yeah, right. That's and, and, that the, and that people who don't have options other than the bus um, right. can't have a life on Saturday. Or Sunday, or right. either through the week, for that matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all so much um, yeah. for sharing your stories uh, with us, and thank you for the uh, people who attended and put forward their questions and comments. And um, and thank you, Renee, for organizing this. Um, oh, and thank you, and thank you uh, to Race Matters Friends for all the work put into it. I greatly appreciate all their help, all the help that uh, uh, Chad gave us. Yeah. With, without that kind of technical help, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, yeah. Okay. Okay. We, you know, we, we may be doing this again, but, um, yeah. you know, but no, and next time it might go smoother. <laughs> Thank you. And like I said, we don't want to be hard hard nosed and, and troublemakers, but we you know we want to we want some kind of uh we do have life, but a better life as far as getting we want more, I don't want to say fairness or yeah, equity. Well, it's civil rights. You yeah. know, it's a civil right. Yeah. To, for us yeah. to be able to access the buses and not have the like we don't matter. Us. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, well, finally, um, that I'm going to close this out with Ian Thomas makes a comment. Thanks to Race Matters friends, Renee, Martha, and all for putting this together. I'm shocked by much of what I've heard as it relates to city processes, employee training. Please do put together a list. I will make other council members aware, but it will also be valuable if disabilities commissions and PTAC submit a joint report. And that's from Ian Thomas, our uh, city council member from Fourth Ward. So thank you, Ian, for attending and listening and your willingness to take the message forward. Yes. And thank you, Martha. Yeah. Okay. My, my pleasure. Um, okay. Until next time. Uh, We'll be signing off and okay. um, and uh, we'll hopefully see each other again and continue advocating for um, these civil rights.
Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you Renee. Okay. Okay. Thank Bye-bye. You. Bye. Bye.